Alopecia areata is suspected to affect about 700,000 individuals in the United States at any given time. This is when the immune system attacks the hair follicles, causing them to fall out, and there's many different forms or presentations of alopecia areata. The most common is small circular patches of hair, and this can affect a large number of individuals at any point during their life, and most people will have a full recovery. However, in some individuals, this may progress to be a more severe variant. We've talked about alopecia areata before on the channel. I'll show that video up here. And we referenced this when Jada Pinkett Smith was discussing her hair loss and there was quite a big snafu at the Oscars. However, there are several different types of alopecia areata. We have the ophiasis pattern, which is particularly stubborn to treat because that's the complete loss of hair around the sides. And we also have alopecia totalis, where you have complete hair loss over the entire scalp. And lastly, there is alopecia universalis, where an individual may lose every hair all over their body. That can include, of course, the scalp, the eyebrows, eyelashes, the axillary, and groin hair. Up until recently, there have really not been any treatments that are approved by the FDA to treat alopecia areata in any of its forms. That doesn't mean that we're not pursuing treatments for those things. We're just using off-label treatments or things that are not technically approved by the FDA specifically for alopecia areata. But as physicians, we're making a judgment based on an understanding of the disease and an understanding of the different drugs available to treat it, what could work. And oftentimes we're able to have some good success with that. Some of the most common treatments we use currently are topical steroids. Topical steroids, when placed on the scalp in a cream or a liquid form, can help to soak into the skin and suppress that immune attack against the hair follicle. If we need to get a little bit more aggressive, we can do intralesional steroid injections that you can see here. When we inject the steroids, we're getting that down a lot closer to the base of the hair follicle where that immune attack is occurring. And especially for those smaller circular patches, we can get excellent regrowth of hair. Now, of course, if you have hair loss that's more than just a couple small circular patches, injections can be quite painful because we're covering a lot larger area. I've had some patients who only want me to inject their eyebrows, for example, because they're able to wear a hairpiece or a wig to cover their scalp, but it's a lot harder to regrow or to get hair to cover the eyebrows, so we may just do injections in that area. Recently, there have been other medications come onto the market that could be helpful but are still not approved by the FDA, and these can include topical calcineurin inhibitors. These are other medicines like tacrolimus or pimecrolimus cream that are immune suppressive medications in a cream form, but they're not a steroid. So we don't have to worry about things like steroid addiction, steroid withdrawal, or thinning of the skin, the development of telangiectasia, some of the other things that we may see with long-term use of topical steroids. These medications are generally well tolerated, but they're not always the most potent. They don't always lead to regrowth of the hair. We've talked about alopecia areata treatments before also, like squaric acid. Squaric acid is an irritant that you can put on the skin. And what happens is when you place that on the skin, it kind of changes the immune response because the immune system can't really do two different things at once. So when you intentionally give a contact dermatitis by squaric acid, the immune system has to shift to try to resolve that contact dermatitis and it can't really attack the hair follicles. The problem with squaric acid is it doesn't always work and sometimes it can lead to a pretty exuberant reaction. People can get quite itchy. So we have to be careful about how we administer things like squaric acid, but it's still an off-label treatment. It's not approved by the FDA for the treatment of alopecia areata. Again, this is just the ingenuity of physicians knowing the disease and knowing these treatments to try to have treatments available that can help our patients. All of this changed recently with the approval of a new medication by the FDA specifically to treat alopecia areata. This medication is called baricitinib, or the brand name is Illumiant. This is a medicine in the family called JAK inhibitors, and these are small molecules, and they're available by a pill or a tablet that you can take. This is an immune modulating treatment, and the way that a JAK inhibitor works, uh, we have to understand a little bit about what a JAK is. That stands for Janus Activated Kinase, and this is a family of intracellular, so these little JAK molecules sit inside our cells, and they help with signal transduction. So if you can think of the cell as having that shell or that lipid bilayer that kind of separates the inside of the cell from the outside, when the body wants to tell that cell to do something, it has to communicate. And we use these things to help bridge the gap from the outside world of the cell to the inside world of the cell. And these use signal conductors, chemicals like cytokines or interleukins to attach to the outside of the cell 
and to conduct a signal or a message inside of the cell. Part of that pathway can be these Janus activated kinases, and we have four different types. We have JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, and another one called TYK2, TYK2. These have to attach to the inside of these signal transducers to receive a message and then they act further downstream to turn on certain things. And one of the things that these jack molecules do is they turn on inflammatory markers. And that can contribute to an immune response that causes problems if it's too exuberant, leading to disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and yes, alopecia areata. So we can use medicines like JAK inhibitors to stop those little Janus activated kinases from taking that signal and perpetuating it downstream. We've had several JAK inhibitors on the market for the treatment primarily of rheumatoid arthritis. Things like tofacitinib and even the one we're talking about today, baricitinib, has been on the market for about four years for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. It's really common for a pharmaceutical company to take a drug that they know works for one indication and do clinical trials to test it for other indications. Sometimes this is done intentionally because they know based on its mechanism it should help for this other indication. And sometimes we discover it accidentally. For example, Viagra was initially marketed as a blood pressure medication and they found that it had an interesting side effect and it became marketed for a completely different indication. So when we look at baricitinib or Illumiant, it's manufactured by a pharmaceutical company called Lilly. And this of course is not sponsored in any way because we are definitely going to talk about some of the risks that could be associated with taking Illumiant. It is helpful to know, however, that this drug has been on the market and has been used for other indications. It's not a brand new drug. We have other safety data out there because it's been used in patients with rheumatoid arthritis for a number of years. How did they come to the conclusion that this works for alopecia areata? Well, they did what's called a phase three study, and that's kind of the terminal study before a drug is eligible to get FDA approval for its indication. And they took about 1,200 patients with severe alopecia areata, and they gave them either a two milligram dose or a four milligram dose of baricitinib, and of course they had a placebo group that didn't receive any of the active medication. What they showed is that the individuals who took that four milligram dose once a day that had severe alopecia areata, about 40% of them regrew most or all of the hair that they had lost due to the condition. This led to the approval of the drug, and so for those patients who have severe alopecia areata, we have a new medicine that's actually the first approved for the treatment of alopecia areata. Now, because this medication is available only by brand name, there's no generic available, it's of course really expensive. Like most pharmaceutical companies, when they develop a new drug, Lilly is working really hard to get this on formulary, meaning that most insurance companies, they have a formulary of drugs that they approve. So Lilly will work and they'll negotiate to get this drug on formulary with most major insurance plans so that it's covered. But even then it can be available at a really high deductible. And this is where the pharmaceutical company will have copay assistance and for individuals who can't get this one approved on their insurance plan. They often have prescription assistance forms available that you can fill out with the help of your doctor's office to get this medicine often for a low or no cost to you out of pocket, but there's still costs associated with the system in whole. Insurance premiums can go up as a result of using really expensive medication. So all of these are a bigger discussion in the healthcare system today. I really just wanna focus on the purpose of this medication, its safety profile, and if it's appropriate for you and questions you could ask your doctor. So if you have severe alopecia areata, this is not just the small circular patches. This is refractory to treatment. Nothing else seems to be working and it's covering a lot of your head or even your entire head or body. That's an appropriate time to ask your doctor if this medicine would be appropriate for you. Now, the cost will come into factor and then let's talk about some of the safety profiles. This family of JAK inhibitors comes with what's called a boxed warning from the FDA, meaning there's potentially some really serious side effects that can occur. Now, most of these serious side effects were first observed in that rheumatoid arthritis patient. Now, rheumatoid arthritis is a really significant autoimmune disorder. The patients tend to be much more prone to infections, even things like lymphoma. And so they tend to have a lot more risk of these really serious adverse reactions. One thing that we saw recently is that there was a JAK inhibitor that has been used in rheumatoid arthritis and then eventually was approved for eczema or atopic dermatitis that we use in the dermatology side. And the patients in the atopic dermatitis trials had a lot lower risk of these serious adverse reactions than we saw in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So that gives us a little bit of comfort that 
The rheumatoid arthritis patient is a more serious, more sick patient, and they have a higher rate of these adverse effects. But because the drug did show an increased risk of these particular side effects, we have to be concerned about that regardless of the reason that we're using that medication. So yes, we do get concerned about it for the treatment of eczema or atopic dermatitis, and certainly for alopecia areata. The box warning for all JAK inhibitors says that it has a higher risk of serious infections and all-cause mortality, as well as malignancies, cardiac side effects like heart attacks and stroke, and thrombosis or blood clots forming. And if that all sounds very scary, it, it is. It's scary stuff. And this does have the potential for some serious adverse reactions, which is why this medicine shouldn't just be written and handed out to everybody that has alopecia areata. You really need to try some of the other treatments first, in my opinion, and have a serious discussion with your doctor if this one is appropriate for you. Now those are the most serious adverse reactions that can occur and they happen in a minority of people. It's not the most common things. Much more commonly we're going to see things like gastrointestinal upset, upper respiratory tract infection, so getting a cough and cold a little bit easier. Maybe it takes a little bit longer for that to go away. And individuals who take these medications are a little bit higher risk of reactivations of herpes simplex like oral labial herpes or genital herpes or herpes zoster. That's shingles. And we just saw another video recently with a reactivation of shingles called Ramsey-Hunt syndrome in Justin Bieber. So if you haven't checked that out, you can see my breakdown on that video, what is Ramsey-Hunt syndrome and how to treat it. Now, although this medication does have the potential for some serious side effects, we're using generally fairly low doses for our patients with alopecia areata. We're gonna monitor these patients very closely with their laboratory. We're going to make sure that they're not experiencing these things. We're gonna warn our patients what they should be looking for. In my opinion, this medicine will be a really a valuable addition to our toolkit in addressing patients with severe alopecia areata. It's important to have a serious discussion with your doctor if you're considering going on this medication, but it's gonna be life-changing for a number of patients. And one of the most frustrating things to me about treating alopecia areata is that many insurance companies simply consider it cosmetic when it's clearly not. Yes, hair can be a cosmetic issue, and I talked a lot about my journey with hair loss in a previous video, which you can watch up here as well. But hair loss is a very psychologically challenging condition. Your hair can be a huge part of your identity. And we've seen that with the way that Jada Pinkett Smith reacted to her hair loss. We can see that with you know what I went through and I see it with what many of my patients go through is that clearly alopecia areata is not a cosmetic condition. It is a medical condition and it deserves to have FDA approved treatments that can help to change an individual's life. I'm excited that this has been approved and in the right patient. I'm excited to use it as I have that discussion with, you know, I've got some patients in mind right now. I hope you found this information helpful. This is a great medication to come onto the market and I hope that it is life-changing and that it's well-received and has a great safety profile as we see it rolled out into the population. Thanks again for watching and following along. Let me know if you guys have questions about baricitinib, Illumiant, if you have questions about alopecia areata. Even though we've addressed it on the channel, I'm happy to answer more questions for you and to make sure that you're getting the information about it that you want. Thanks for following along, subscribing to the channel, and sharing this video with somebody else that might be suffering from alopecia areata. I hope this information is helpful to them as well, and I'll see you on the next video.